Hello. I'd like to talk to you today about something that we tend to talk about a lot, which is immigration, in connection with something that we do not talk about as much, which is integration. So I was told that the best way to disrupt any audience is to use the F word. Um, so let me see if this is going to work. So I'm a female. 50, a feminist, and a foreigner. I came to London 25 years ago um, to escape the siege of my city, Sarajevo. Almost overnight, a normal life in the city that hosted Winter Olympics in 1984 turned into a nightmare. We were bombed, sniped at, starved, and that went on for um, four years. I was a journalist and I worked for international news organization and um, two years down the road, they helped me escape that nightmare. So I survived. I was not prepared for my new life in London as a refugee. It was a very difficult experience. I felt lost and heartbroken. And as difficult as it was, I still considered myself to be lucky. Lucky that I was not raped, wounded, or killed. Um, lucky that I was not detained in immigration detention when I arrived here. Lucky that I was able to work and study and look after my family and rebuild my life. Um, I found purpose in working with migrants and refugees because I realized that many of them that I met on my journey were not as lucky as I thought um, I was. So for the past 18 years, I have been working at Migrants Organize, which is an organization of migrants and refugees for migrants and refugees. So our main aim is to be a platform for integration. So we connect people, we build common ground, we grow our power, the power of migrants and refugees to organize and have a say in the processes that have impact upon our lives. So at Migrants Organize, we have mentored thousands of people who were traumatized, isolated, lonely. We provided them with good legal advice, free English classes, and supported them to get on with their lives. Um, and make a contribution. So over the past um, several years, we supported three and a half thousand migrant and refugee doctors and dentists from 98 countries. And they needed support with training in order to pass verification exams. So now they're working in NHS and you might have been treated by some of them. This is Tiru. Tiru is a dancer from Sri Lanka. He fled in fear for his life after he spoke out against oppression. When he arrived to UK to seek protection, he was detained. He, then he got stuck in a very bureaucratic and adversarial system for several years. When he came to Migrants Organize, he was very quiet and still fearful for his future. Our holistic support, including mentoring and volunteering and activities and advice enable Thiru um, not only to recover, but to thrive. Thiru has been recognized as a refugee. He went on to study dance therapy and he's working, studying, volunteering, dancing. Um, in other words, he's integrated. Seven years ago, um, Migrants Organized established the Women on the Move Awards and the main purpose of, of this event is to honor migrant and refugee women who make difference in their communities, women who overcome um, their very difficult experiences sometimes and then help other people in need. They're the most inspiring examples of resilience and civic participation. So our two winners this year are Vika and Florence and they live in Halifax and they are both still stuck in the asylum system. They're unable to work and unable to study. 
And just like Thiru and thousands of other people, while they're waiting for um, their fates to be determined, they have no choice but to live in accommodation which is in a very bad state of disrepair. However, V and Floor, as we call them, did not just accept this. So they spoke out and inspired other people to share their experiences of inadequate accommodation and the impact this has on their safety and their dignity. Um, but it did not just stop at talking about problems. V and Floor also organized themselves into Sisters United and inspired their community, their neighbors, churches, and local authority to stand in solidarity with them. And we organized and came up with residence charter, where basically they drafted a compact as an invitation to accommodation provider, which is a private company, to work with tenants to deliver better services and to treat people with dignity and respect. So this year, Migrants Organized has become a community sponsor. This is a very new scheme in the UK and we campaigned really hard for it. The government has agreed that um, we can organize as communities and pull our money and resources together and then sponsor a refugee family that is somewhere in a refugee camp either in Turkey and Lebanon right now. And then we will meet the costs of their resettlement in the UK. So we're working with a group of wonderful volunteers who are all staff at Amnesty International. We call them the Welcome Committee, as you can see. And um, we've just a few weeks ago welcomed our first family from, of six from the refugee camp in Turkey. And uh, they're now starting their new life in South London, supported by our volunteers. And there are thousands of people um, around the country who are doing this important work of integration. They're amazing people who put their time, their skills and their goodwill into practical actions of welcome. And this is, I believe, where the best integration happens in this two-way street where immigrants, uh, new arrivals encounter their neighbors um, who are welcoming them and becoming friends. There's so much goodwill out there, but we do not hear about this on the news. Um, stories of welcome and civic participation and contribution of migrants um, who, uh, and people who are working hard to welcome them, that's not news. And largely because good people do good work quietly. Instead, we hear stories that scare us, um, stories that dehumanize people and turn immigrants into waves and floods that we should be afraid of. But even if we resist this fear mongering, the consequence of this negative narrative is that most of us think of integration as something that immigrants should do. So we expect immigrants to learn English, to get a job, to learn about our culture and customs fit in. And there is nothing wrong with that. But unless you had to deal with the immigration system, you will have no understanding of obstacles and barriers to integration. A few years ago, I was about to deliver a speech in front of Yarlswood Immigration Detention Center. Um, and Im we were protesting because immigration um, detention has no time limit. And um, there is no judicial oversight. So I know people who have been locked up like that for months and in, in some cases for years. So I was about to speak as I did today about how lucky I was that I was not killed or wounded or locked up. And, you know, lucky to be allowed to work. Um, but a speaker before me held up Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And then she started reading through the list of rights. And I became very upset. I was shaking. I was so angry and sad at the same time. I realized, perhaps for the first time, how wrong it is 
to think of myself as lucky for surviving the war in exile, for not being locked up. Safety, dignity, and basic human rights should not be a matter of luck. Our structures in our society are not yet set up for integration as a two-way process. We talk about social, economic, and cultural integration, but an important element for meaningful integration is missing. Philosopher Hannah Arendt, who was a refugee and stateless for many years, I think defines that missing link in my mind um, as the right to have rights. And she wasn't talking about human rights. She was talking about citizenship. And I think not being a citizen, it's not just about not being able to travel or not being able to vote. It's not even about identity or where we belong. It's about what belongs to us. That day, in front of Yarlswood Detention Center, I felt how pre precious and fragile basic human rights are, how easily they can be given and taken away. I felt as vulnerable as I was on the streets of Sarajevo under the siege. Over the past 25 years, the rights that I had as a non-citizen when I first arrived were gradually taken away from migrants and refugees. So if I came to seek protection in London right now, I would not be allowed to work or study I wouldn't get access to free legal advice or English classes. I would probably be detained upon arrival and then dispersed to a place like Halifax. I would have to survive on five pounds a day. And I wouldn't have money for public transport. I would be stuck in this limbo, warehoused for several years, while decision is being made on whether I'm allowed to stay or not. Yet, I would be expected to integrate. I was going to say that I was lucky to have had the support of friends and organizations such as Migrants Organized, but I hope you will agree with me now that it's not about luck. In 2014, an official hostile environment immigration policy was introduced that made life and therefore integration of many migrants and refugees impossible. In a nutshell, public services, NHS, schools, universities, employers, landlords, and banks have become border guards and have to check the immigration status of their patients, students, employees, and customers. But immigration status is complicated. And as a result of these hostile and restrictive policies, many people have been denied services and healthcare and have been discriminated and racially profiled in a process. In the recent example that we now know as the Windrush scandal, citizenship has been denied to people who have lived in this country for decades. In some cases, they entered the country as citizens during colonial times. They had no need to worry about paperwork then. But now the rules have changed and thousands of people no longer have the right to have rights. As a result, some people were denied life-saving treatment in the NHS, lost jobs and homes, were deported and separated from their families, and sadly, some of them died. When we start restricting and taking away rights from people in this way, we're making it impossible for them to do things that we want them to do to demonstrate that they belong and that they're integrating. It's a lose-lose situation for immigrants and for host communities. In the 21st century, we need to imagine new ways of belonging and inclusion. In this fast-moving world, we're connected whether we like it or not. 
not only through social media or you know, consumerism, but also through our shared fears and responsibility for the future of our children, our democracy, and our planet. Migrants bring bridge cultures, countries, and economies. We are integrating the world. We belong to different places with ease because those places also belong to us. So we need to have a say and be heard. The way we put it in our work at Migrants Organize is that if we're not around the table, we're probably on the menu. And what we bring to the table is the joy, the learning and the creativity of diversity. So perhaps in 21st century, we can imagine citizenship not as a privilege, not necessarily as legal status either, but as a way to treat people that is a reflection of our values, such as dignity, human rights, justice, equality, inclusion, and welcome. How can we do that? The legendary US Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm said, if they don't give you a seat at the table, bring a folding chair. So perhaps we can build a bigger table to make room for us, um, those of us who come with our folding chairs. After all, as migrants and refugees, we were citizens somewhere else. And we're now just citizens interrupted. We can rebuild our lives and integrate, but only if we have the right to have rights. That should not be difficult. We're human wherever we are. Thank you.